They say that it takes 10,000 hours of practice at something to become an expert. I did a rough calculation and I reckon I've done about 65,000 hours worth of programming. I don't really know what that means in terms of my expertise or not. What I'm fairly sure though is if you've done that much programming you've probably done some fairly silly things during the course of it. This is a slightly different video today and during it I'd like to explore the five stupidest things that I've ever done with a computer. Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery and this is a slightly different episode. So first I would like to say thank you to all of my viewers and particularly if you've subscribed. We've just passed a thousand subscriptions to our video channel of which we're delighted. It's, it's, it's a wonderful thing. So we thought in celebration we'd do something a little bit different, a little bit sillier uh, maybe uh, to, to my usual videos. Uh, during my course of my career uh, I've played with computers. I started off as a hobbyist rather than as a professional, just playing with computers for, for fun, writing games and things like that. And over the course of that time, I've ended up doing some fairly dumb, silly things from time to time. So here's my top five. I should warn you that I might do another version of this at some point in the future, because when I tried to get my top five, I ended up with a list of about 20 stupid things that I've done with computers over the years. But these seem to be the ones that, that, that stuck in my mind in terms of the top five. So in at number five, spying on management. So in the early 1980s, I had a job for, for a, a software development. We were working in early versions of uh, OS2. This was kind of not very long after networks became commonly available for small computers uh, like IBM PCs. Uh, and at that time, we had computers that looked a little bit like this, and in this particular environment, we had a, we had a printer connected to our computer for the normal day-to-day -day work of the office. That was relatively unusual. We had a shared printer <coughs> uh, uh, connected to our network. In those days, all of the nice device driver stuff and all that kind of thing for operating printers wasn't in place. Uh, and, and so the printers worked a little bit differently. The other key attribute of this, this working environment was that our management wasn't very nice. They were rather um, uh, conspiratorial uh, and scheming in the way in which they, they, they went about business, uh, at least from our perspective. And so when they, were, when they were putting things through to the printer, the way that that worked was not quite how it would work today. What you wanted to, what you did if you wanted to print something out on our shared printer was that you generated a document, you dropped the document into a folder uh, on, on, the, on the server connected to the printer, and there was a little process that just monitored the contents of that folder. On a timer basis, a little process would kick in, identify, pick up the, the document and print it out. As I said, our management weren't very nice in this organisation and to be honest, we didn't trust them very much. So me and a friend, we decided that we'd keep an eye on what was going on and understand a little bit more about what was going on in our organisation. So we wrote a little programme that we deployed to the server. And what happened now was at the point at, at, at when somebody printed something out, our program would search for particular keywords. We put in all of our names and things like fired or pay cut and those sorts of things. And if it matched that criteria, uh, we'd make a copy of, of that and, and we'd, we'd, we'd send it to, to a different folder where, where we could have a quick look at what was going on. Probably not an ideal recommended piece of software. To, to, to develop and probably not a very nice environment in which to operate. So that's my number five uh, approach. Number four, playing tunes on a floppy drive. This is kind of popular now. If you want to, uh, I'll put some links below to versions of this which were much more sophisticated than the version uh, that, that, that we, we did. Um, but in the olden days, storage looked like this. Uh, we had a floppy disk. This is a five and a quarter inch floppy disk and a floppy disk drive, which would read data and write data to floppy disks. The storage for the floppy disk was quite small. 
But the key attribute that was intre of interest in terms of uh, music was this thing. This is the stepper motor of the, the, the floppy disk. And it used to make z -z 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 noises. So me and a friend decided that we'd play with this. And so we wrote some software that played tunes. You could give it a little simple file of the notes that you wanted it to play and then it would play those back by moving the stepper motor at different speeds so go and make this kind of noise. As I say, I've put a link below to some fantastic ones. One of my favourites is the Darth Vader theme played on a collection of eight different floppy drives. Take a look, they're a lot of fun. Number three in my list of all-time stupid pieces of software is watching Windows. Uh, in the 1980s, uh, Windows looked like this. This is Windows 2.0. I did start programming on Windows version 1, which had tiled windows. You couldn't overlap windows. Windows 2 introduced the great innovation of allowing us to, 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 to overlap the windows and control them. Now, one of the things about Windows, particularly in the early days, one of the tricks that you could do was a thing called Windows superclassing. You could introduce a program that would be that would intercept interactions with Windows for every window that was opened. So we, me and a friend again, we, we, we had a laugh about this and we, we played around and we wrote a little program. So every single time that you opened a new window uh, uh, within Windows, uh, a little man would pop up from the bottom and would take a look at the content of the window and would comment on it. We put a bunch of kind of rude comments about the content of the window and it would just select one randomly and, and, and pop up. And, and we, we had a lot of fun with that for, for two or three weeks before we got bored. Coming up to my top two now, stupid things to do with computers. <laughs> I'm sure that there's a whole bunch of people out there that have done stupider things or at least as stupid things as these. So if you have, please do put them in the comments be below. It'll be a lot of fun to see what other things uh, people have done uh, over the years. In at number two, line printer space invaders. This was a really stupid thing and with a 21st century sensibility, incredibly wasteful of trees. Uh, but I was... I learned to program in the, the, the kind of first generation of popular home computers. Uh, I, I had a ZX81 and a ZX Spectrum and those sorts of things. And I taught myself to program in first basic and then in assembler, uh, writing games and so on. At some point, I decided that I really liked doing this and would like to become professional. And I hadn't got any qualifications for that at the time. And I saw advertised a programming course, which I signed up for. Um, at a local further education institution. I made a bit of a mistake. Uh, this was a programming course in COBOL. Uh, and I started write, learning to write COBOL on this programming course on a multi-user CPM machine, a very, very slow. Uh, and this was the kind of programming where you wrote the program, you submitted the source code, you found out a day later whether it compiled or not with a long printout of all the mistakes and typos that were in your, uh, in your program. This was a very different kind of experience to the one that I'd had so far. And so I got a little bit bored with this. And it also the teaching of the programming languages was very slow because I was used to programming languages. I was picking it up more quickly than some of the other people in the class. So as a side project, I decided that I was going to write a game in COBOL to run on these computers. So I ran this, I wrote this game. The only real output for these programs was a line printer. That there wasn't a, a video display that you could easily access, at least in the context of the class that I was undertaking. So I thought it would be rather silly to write uh, a game, a version of Space Invaders that ran on a line printer. This was incredibly stupid. So what it would do is that each you would press a button uh, to move to move the, the your your base spaceship or to fire fire a missile, and that would kind of move that, and then it would print out the next version of the screen on a dot matrix printer, and then you you could kind of press a button again, and it would do something similar. I've tried to capture a, at least a flavor of that in this silly animation but it was very funny at the time um, uh, uh, and used quite a lot of paper. 
Number one uh, in my list of dumb things to do. Um, in the early stages of my career, I worked, I worked in computer manufacturers. I worked for a couple of different PC manufacturers uh, during that time. And uh, I worked, the, the, the next part of the building to me uh, was the repair shop for, for broken computers. So we had access to quite a lot of hardware and quite a lot of kit. This was again in the kind of um, the mid to early 80s um, uh, kind of period. And, and, and at that time, the graphics cards, uh, the, the, the video cards in the computers were very cr crude. The first versions of IBM PCs and their clones didn't really do graphics at all. It was only with CGA and, and with Hercules that we introduced the ability to do kind of uh, dot matrix resolution pictures on the screen. Uh, and, and so computers looked a bit like this and graphics cards uh, uh, looked a bit like this. This was actually the version of the graphics card that one of the ma manufacturers that I worked on sold. The key part of this graphics card is this. This is the 6845 um, cathode ray controller chip. Um, and you could misprogram this thing. There was a rumor that if you programmed this thing incorrectly, you could damage a monitor. Uh, uh, Hercules uh, famously put out this rumor to try and discredit other manufacturer, manufacturers of other brands of cards. But it, it wasn't really about their, their stuff more than anybody else's. It was just the nature of the things that you could do. Um, there's, looking on the internet these days, there's some stuff about this that's, that's, that's some, somewhat skeptical and thinks it's only because Hercules, Hercules put out the advert saying that you could damage the monitor with, with competitors' cards. But actually, we were working in this environment. We had access to some hardware. We had some monitors that were classified as scrap because they'd been, that they had intermittent faults that, uh, that the, the, the engineers couldn't detect. And so they were just classified as scrap. They were going to be thrown away. So we thought we'd play with this and we'd try it out. So we started writing some code to play with the, the, different, the, the different refresh rates and all that kind of stuff in their chip. And yes, it's true. You can set fire to a monitor through software. Uh, if you misprogram the, uh, the the chip appropriately, you can change you can change it, and so the, the monitor overheats. It's not quite as dramatic as my animation here. It was more kind of a tss, 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 fizzle and smoke and, and, and a kind of noise when the monitor when the monitor stopped working. But you can damage the hardware through inappropriate use of software. At least you could in those days. So. That's my number one. Those are my uh, those are my five things, five dumb things that I've done with software during my career. Uh, please do let us know if you've got some better stories than mine and put them in the comments below. So I'd like to wrap up by saying thank you very much to all of my uh, viewers and subscribers so far. And if you haven't already subscribed, please hit the subscribe button and the like button if you liked the video. Thank you.